Thanks so much for having us uh, at the EPFL. We, we did manage to actually go to the school once or twice, which is nice, uh, and meet the students um, IRL. Um, but yeah, it's a shame we've kind of been doing most of this from uh, Zoom, obviously. Um, but yeah, so um, it's our first time here and we thought we'd kind of get to the core of things. So our studio was focusing uh, on stone um, and exploring the potential of the material, its history um, and ideas for the future. Um, so I guess as a, as a practice, as a symbol, um, we're interested in how things are made and what that means in terms of our society and visually. Um, and so the studio was founded on this belief um, that an understanding of how things are made brings an intimate engagement with the problems and possibilities of the real world. And we're interested in the material life of buildings, how we process the fabric of our environments um, and yeah, kind of interested in local resources, global trade, vernacular methods, new technology, quite broad. Um, but I guess we try to really focus um, on stone. So it's physical material qualities, um, the local infrastructures of skill, labor and technology, and it's um, kind of historical contemporary uses. Um, and we wanted to, well, originally we wanted to, uh, to focus um, on a quarry in France, in Arles, um, that as you will find out later, obviously that had to change. But this idea of being based in a quarry is really exciting anyway, because it's this idea of really being at the source of where the material is coming from and all the skills and labor being really uh, in such close proximity to it. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> so we kind of had to adapt our brief, um, obviously, as, as COVID continued. Um, but the core idea was the same. So again, looking at the context and looking at the materials of stone. Um, and so the brief was really trying to combine ideas of um, research, uh, but also one-to-one -one prototyping, as we think that's really important to bring together um, critical thinking and direct making. So this was our brief, um, which was learning from stone buildings, so things that have already been built uh, that we can learn a lot from, building something ourselves and um, mapping the site, and then I guess producing proposals. So um, the first task was for the students to build uh, one to 10 models of uh, existing buildings, which um, uh, Camille will introduce in a minute. And then uh, a kind of collective building activity where we build a stone barbecue together. Um, and uh, kind of exploring drawing and thinking about what does it mean to inhabit a space? Um, and so really trying to to open up our minds and our hands to what um, those images could be like. And then um, the idea was to have a one-to-one -one souvenir at the end, which is made of stone, but because of access to workshops, uh, we've altered that as well uh, in the end, which you'll see. So yeah, we've uh, stayed in Lausanne, which was actually really great um, in the end because it meant students could go back to the site quite easily. Um, and we chose um, Quarry, which is about an hour away, um, and Wallace de Villarlo. Uh, and we've asked people to map the site and the students did an incredible amount of work um, considering as well it was I guess a bit tricky but in pairs they worked throughout the semester and kind of mapped um, obviously the physical location um, and also the social kind of who's working there, how do they connect to other people, the geology and the kind of material economies about which connect to stone in the region. Um, and yeah, so they had to think about all those things. And um, this is just a quick summary of the different workshops we, we ran. So we had a lecture uh, by Ruben Castro, who um, used to run the model making workshop by Peter Zunther. And so he talked a lot about models and what they can do and how you can use them to develop design, um, which is really great. Uh, then we also had a lecture by Marie Jacotti. She's an artist. Um, and she makes beautiful hand drawings. And we did a, uh, we got a sto professional stone mason um, to do a, the workshop making a barbecue with us in the quarry. Um, so Jean-Louis Lambert, he was um, really great. He was there for two days um, showing different things. Obviously it's a very brief introduction to stone masonry. I don't think anyone became very professional at it, but it was, it was great having someone knowledgeable there. 
and the quarry um, also really kindly allowed us to use their workshops um, uh, for those two days. And then we had a crit with um, really great guests, um, so an architect, uh, Sana, Sana, a stone engineer from Stono, and uh, another architect uh, from London. And then we had our final crit uh, recently, um, which included one of the architects of a precedent that the students did. So over to Kami. Thank you, Maria. Uh, well, hello. So yes, we, well, I'll just go very briefly. Uh, we started the semester then by uh, gathering a long list of uh, building precedents that were not really organized neither chronologically or, or geographically. It was, uh, they were really selected for some specific qualities of stone construction or historical um, uh, reasons. Uh, so we asked the students to pick a selection. So each pair had to pick a building, a uh, part of the long list. Um, and we asked them to look carefully at those buildings through the notions of labor, labor and extraction, the notion of geology and temporality and how long the stone, how long does it take to, to actually build a stone building at the time, what was the technology involved, what was the labor involved, what was the relationship of power and belief around it. Um, and then we asked them to uh, also then redraw simple plans and, and drawings and then this, this side of a detail uh, to build a model uh, to one to 10. So the, the model making was both an analytical part. So the idea was that they would learn something oh, and that yeah. each group would get something from the buildings uh, and the model making. So this is a, like a part of the long list. So some of the buildings and I've just um, yeah, picked some very, uh, a few of them just to go through quickly. So we had, well, here, uh, over the 10 buildings, we had like the 200 columns, so Climat France by Fernand Pouillon. We had the, uh, well, yeah, with that we're starting now. Um, so the idea is, well, I'm not gonna do like a detail, detailed analysis of each building, but the, so it, a group that also studied the building, they got really interested in the, in the columns and the technology of building in stone in the, in the 50s by Pouillon, using actually the massive stone and crossing, crossing the Mediterranean Sea from France to, uh, to Alger uh, and the monumentality and the, the scale of uh, this building. So the students produced a model can, um, looking at both the, the size of the column, the, so the columns and the courtyards and the building in actual masonry wall uh, on the other side. Um, then we had, we can go next, just quickly another, so slightly more recent example by uh, Gilles Perraudin in the 90s, that is a wine cellar, where as well, the question of building technology was quite uh, in question because uh, obviously those blocks used there were exactly coming from the quarry. So those blocks are dimension following the, the quarry cutting them in the standard dimensions and uh, put in place. It's 100% stone, so there is no mortar. It's like completely, uh, it's quite a direct relationship to, to construction. So the students uh, here as well produced a model one to 10 looking at um, the materiality of the stone and what it creates so, and creating a, um, like a building photographs. So, because it's quite, it's a rather simple building. So it was quite interesting to delve into the actual process of making the models and creating this atmosphere and this materiality that was created by this uh, stone in the south of France. Then um, we had some other way older examples like the one in India, Patipositri, that is a, a whole royal actual Alas, it's a, actually an agglomeration of buildings. Uh, the columns are so quite important here in this, uh, in this project. And uh, what was quite interesting is uh, the students so focused on, on colonnades and ornaments. So you can see here in the plans here, it's, it's essentially an addition of well, colonnades and courtyard buildings and palaces. Uh, most of them, so it's all made of red sandstone and most of them were based on traditionally uh, timber architecture that were then completely translated into stone, so creating some uh, form of ambiguity. And the students looked at, uh, in that case, um, a specific column, but also the notion of ornament and the labor that it uh, Im implies to actually ornate and what process of work uh, uh, is related to ornament. And this building, notably the, <clears throat> the craftsmen actually were quite present in the process and the and had some freedom, so they made a one to two column here. Um, 
the model. Then we had a way more recent example in Clack and Work Clothes that is also questioning the, the process of construction and the relationship of how, like the process of extraction and the different finishes of the stone and um, in a more contemporary building. So here the facade of Clack and Work Clothes. Um, so the geometrical and here's the students like looked at the process and how to actually represent conceptually uh, this notion of like the smooth, the, the straight, the marks of extraction, and then actually choosing to do it in timber and do that model with an axe. <laughs> so, and we can finally, there was just another example of this uh, church in, uh, in Switzerland, this time an early uh, Roman church of the 12th century in Gianico, uh, where the building process is also quite interesting at the time, and the students focused on uh, um, there's holes and the patterns of the facade you can see and the, the way this whole, this whole building was built with scaffolds that were actually attached to the facade. Uh, and so, yeah, I looked at this relationship between the pattern making of uh, the construction process and the actual building. And now I think that should be it. Then this is, yeah, this was just a sample of five projects really. I mean, because <laughs> going through all the 10 is quite long. Um, but this is a bit of a family and each, each, then each group, then this was a starting point, but like learn something from it and then looked at stone in a different manner that really informed then the project proposal. Um, then we can develop on the site. I don't know, over to, back to Maria or Joe. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so back to Lausanne, so more or less developed. So this is the photo of it. Um, some decades ago, when the 60s, I think. Or, um, anyway, so the students managed to get a, a, a drone. And so they got some amazing photographs of the site from all different angles. And as you can see, yeah, it's still an active quarry. Um, and it, it has a, um, you know, kind of new concrete uh, production space with really high end uh, cutting CNC machines. So it only really requires three people to be working there. Um, and it has a, um, a, a kind of domestic, so it has a dwelling, which you can see is the same building as it was in the previous photograph, but now um, it, it just different tenants. So from what we understood is that um, it's just a residential building for, which is rented out to people who don't work on the quarry. They're just living there, <laughs> which is quite interesting. And then a, a kind of couple of old um, workshop buildings, which aren't very used anymore. And then just the amazingly beautiful context of the, the countryside, the landscape, um, and uh, kind of the approach to the quarry is very scenic. And then you can see it here from above. Um, it's quite an exciting place, um, even though it's quite small. So a giant crane bringing stuff up. Um, and um, yeah, I guess it uh, mainly produces uh, more or less um, stone, but it also stores some other stones from the region. And so the students really analyzed um, the different typologies and researched, um, uh, yeah, kind of how the stone is used. And so these are some photographs the students took from um, our barbecue workshop. Um, so kind of carving smaller pieces um, and also trying to build uh, larger structures. Okay. La que? Oh, bueno, oh, por lo menos. Uh, so, um, uh, yes, they built uh, some cool furniture, and this was our sort of a prehistoric gathering uh, for, <laughs> uh, where we had a, a barbecue, uh, seating, and a, a kind of table, ceremony, uh, ceremonial table. Um, and, you know, this was all done in um, under two days, really, uh, without much planning, um, but just a kind of instinctive way of, of kind of learning from the material and just getting to know the basics, really. Um, here they all are in their masks. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's um, over to Joe. And so I guess the, the, the next exercise after this, I've just put in two drawings here, was really to, to try and make some careful drawings of the quarry as it is at the moment. So it's a kind of short mapping exercise where the students were really encouraged to look quite carefully at what was there and record it. And then there was also, um, at this point, the assignment to um, start thinking about proposals 
but before having made any architecture. So it's like, what was the life or what would the life of the building be like if you were to make an image? And we had a workshop by the illustrator Marie Jacotti, which I think was uh, very enjoyable for all. And then um, it, we now just goes through, we'll start talking about proposals and some of the work that they did. So if we move through, I guess. These are some of the, the kind of um, illustrations and sketches that we're encouraging the students to do before the architecture was made that spoke about, I guess, potential use and really it's like a vehicle or way of trying to get them to think about program um, very quickly because we were very um, we were completely open to the question of what the future of this quarry could be and whether it's something that keeps the existing quarry there or whether it's something that's removed. And then as we move through, we've put together, a, we're not gonna go through the individual projects, I should, I should just say, um, but just trying to show you an overview. And then there's the kind of mirror, which I think has got a better, stronger narrative through each student's work if we wanna go into it. But some of the plans and the proposals that came out so I guess this one, um, really looking at uh, Petra and the idea of carving in sort of rocks to make this almost animalistic plan for a <laughs> wine bar in the side of the, of the cave and the quarry. This one looking at the, I guess, in the style of Pou uh, Fernand um, Pou uh, Poulon, I can never say the name. Uh, <laughs> And the idea of columns and looking at uh, architecture where there's a kind of column, but there's three different buildings with three different types of um, columns of different sizes for different use. And you can see also a kind of relaxation of the colonnade to for where the kind of housing is um, and then a kind of stronger column. We'll see some more. So can I ask you one thing? Yeah. Is this the, the image, just out of curiosity, is that Liberas Post Office in Rome that has been put as a, as a reminder in the previous drawing? Um, maybe go... This one. This is, the this is the student. This is the... Maybe I don't understand the... I don't know if I know the reference. Well, Adalberto Libera Post Office, 1934 in uh. Rome. Oh. It seems to me that this is exactly the plan of that one. And I'm it, just wondering whether it was a, was a cultivated reference for, for some sort, because it's, it, covered, it's clad in stone. So it's that's not, it. it's not a given reference for the student. Okay. And if it was a reference, it wasn't one that was um, tongue in cheek. <laughs> yeah. Spoken to us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you can see the kind of building at the top there, the big rectangular building is existing. Right. And in a way, part of the building that we're talking about there, I think is also existing. So the building at the bottom and then the curved one on the side is proposal. And then the one that you're, you're talking about is also, I think, uh, is a, a part proposal. But if the students are there, may here, maybe we can uh, <laughs> learn off them and see. Because it's very, very similar. <laughs> we'll see it in some images, I think. Someone mentioned it at the last um, review, but uh, I don't think it was meant to be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, and then I've just, I just thought it would be nice to place in some more kind of um, drawings before we get onto the, the models. So this is a kind of tower scheme, which acts as, a, I guess, a, a kind of node or point between a series of villages, which is based on a walking path, which goes through the the site. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of uh, seen as a place which is, uh, I guess, <laughs> is seen from these villages and helps to try and kind of bring uh, them together with this kind of central, almost folly-like structure with some, some, some different rooms at the bottom. There's some um, strong reference to Picurnis in that case. I mean, the students were uh, looking at the paths to the Acropolis of Picurnis and the use of um, waste material as well. This is another scheme which um, I think the section is particularly nice. Again, we'll see a model which talks about the creation of a school for stone. 
essentially like a kind of experimental school for stone, akin to something like the Architectural Association's Book Park um, for timber, but for stone, um, where the students really developed a, a language of details and provided um, a kind of series of buildings which could be used as workshops, um, but then also a landscape on the top of this, um, which is a kind of more like a setting for student projects in the future, which will be based on the kind of language and grammar that um, they developed. Um, so quite interesting program that came, came out of that one. And here it's quite faint, but um, the idea again of a stone masonry school, but in the form of a monastery. So taking up a kind of two courtyard typology, but really laid on the site where the contours are really, are really quite strong. So you end up with this um, courtyard, which is kind of kinked and folded, um, particularly nice so kind of element of housing and then also an element of, of workshop. And then I guess this is the building that you're looking at, um, which is, is the one that you, the, you mentioned as the reference, so we'll see. And then I guess we, at the beginning when we started, we really wanted the students to make one-to-one uh, -one details in stone. And I guess where we ended up is with them sat at home with their um, desks. So it moved from stone to maybe more like paper. paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hopefully what we're seeing in these is these kind of series of images is really encouraging the students to bring their proposals to life. Um, so that the sketches that they made really at the beginning, which speak about the, the possibility of what the architecture might be, start to become a little bit more solidified. Um, so past drawings into kind of visual models. So here's one of the schemes, which is looking at, yeah, again, like the interest of making terrazzo reuse of floor and working against the cliff. Also looking at um, something, I guess, akin to some of like uh, Otto Wagner's work, like the postal uh, savings bank with this detail of attaching stone and then having obvious kind of staples, I think they described it as. So the kind of clear visibility of fixings and how actually the way in which something is constructed becomes uh, architectural language, um, which is also kind of ornamental. Um, Again, this is the same group. So in another building, how that language might change. Don't know how much to say. This is the housing of that scheme. This is... Go on, Mira. No, 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 go on. <laughs> no, 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 you can go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, this is a James Bond uh, villa. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, some students who did it. Who did it? Yeah, James Bond, a, a kind of series of pavilions on the site that were really looking at like three very distinct, um, clear typologies. So, like from the circle to the to the rectangle, with different different uses. And this is just some of the images, linking them together. I think quite nice ideas about the construction of of stone. Another group that are looking at, um, again, a kind of base for making stone and then also accommodation with this, uh, I think the next one's about a gallery, the gallery space, which is linking the workshop um, to it. And then I think the housing and accommodation, so different types of uses of stone. This is a cheese making proposal. Uh, using the excavation um, as a place for maturing the cheese and then the building of a new market, market. hall within the quarry for the selling of cheese to the locale. So this is some of the um, cheese maturing in the caves, the quarry. Um, and then the tower proposal that we spoke about earlier. Technically, this is more of a photo montage. And then the school proposal also that we spoke about with this uh, workshops and then landscape at the top, which is really like a kind of 
maths or, um, or Tu viens très bien. J'écoute les, les projets. Can I ask everyone to hear you themselves? <laughs> yes. That would be fantastic. Est-ce que j'écoute? Ah ben écoute. Tadna. Bruno. Bruno. This is the way it is. <laughs> Imagine, ils m'entendent parler là. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Well, we're saying. <laughs> we just get zoom bombed. No. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, this is a proposal to build a, a stone museum, like a kind of place to learn about stone in the quarry. What better place for it? Um, very, very alluring model, I think. <laughs> There's more images. Here's the inside, so kind of, uh, and then uh, the wine caves. The wine cave proposal, yeah, with the kind of animalistic plan we spoke about in the beginning. With some details, thinking about the um, need for cladding, uh, need for uh, services to be surface mounted in the stone, which I appreciate. Um, and then the, the kind of almost monastery proposal that I was talking about, where it sits on a, on a very slope site. I think this one's out of order. Oh yeah, I thought this was nice. This is a, a nice, nice. I think this is the last project. A nice way to end. This is a, a project which is looking where the, the the students were really, I think, thinking about the, I guess, in a more realistic way, how a site like this might be taken over um, over a very long period of time, and thinking about the idea of seasonality and how it could change and how its use might change and did a very developed proposal for many, many different programs in the site from uh, yoga. So like the, the, the building of new buildings and building on the existing to provide things like yoga, but then also made proposals for kind of, uh, I think this is the square of the pig, like uh, eating out with a potential film using the some of the cuts of the quarry in the background and then even i think in the last a kind of christmas time scene round the fire with the presence under the tree this is the last slide this is the last slide, this is the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> merry christmas okay merry christmas thank you very much for this presentation are there any questions remarks commentaries to make on the part of anyone including the ones that don't want to show their faces to us. I, I was wondering if on the next semester you are imagining to maybe still work on stone and uh, this time go to Al or uh, what are you thinking for next semester? Yeah, we'd love to go to Al. Um, and we were also saying, I think regardless of where we go, that we would like to work with stone in a more kind of futuristic way. So we, I feel like we began with the basics um, and now we want to kind of try out new technologies and maybe um, involve kind of engineers early on to try and work with stone in a, a slightly crazier way. Mm. Yeah. I think, yeah, what Maria said. I think that we found that we, and I guess it was part of, the, of, of being on Zoom, but that uh, I think the conversation around the precedence and the culture around stone and being in the quarry was really good and thinking about the, the future uses of that and what it'd be good to concentrate more on is maybe stricter language of how stone is used in construction mm -hmm. and trying to find, we also found it quite difficult, I think, trying to find a new language or, or a way of using stone that doesn't necessarily always look like it was from the 15th century because it's there, I think there is like finding a new grammar for using stone. And so thinking about new technology and how that could help to yeah, use stone. Guys, can I ask you, can I ask you one thing that follows up on that question and maybe that sort of goes back into what you've done. So you had to move because of COVID from Arles to mm -hmm. Switzerland. And I just wonder whether in the process, the project and the, and the, and the brief got Swissened 
in a sense that you start from <laughs> Arles, which is the most famous place for stone vaulting in the 17th century. Mm. So you had La Volta Bay, you have flat vaulting, incredibly mm. sophisticated structures, whereas you've only been using post and lintel or column and arch mm. of masonry, traditional masonry. So in essentially, in a sense, abandoning the Al tradition. Was it functional, a function of moving to Switzerland or you didn't want to do it in the first place? <laughs> I'm not sure how conscious it was, um, if I'm being honest. Mm. <laughs> Uh, but I think maybe it's something to do with um, our precedents. We didn't really look so much at those. I guess the Abaye um, was uh, more like that, but hmm, that's a good question. No, in yeah. a sense, it's Arles, uh, you know, the town hall mm. at Arles yeah, is the much. model to which all the, you know, CAD CAM technology you know, is actually looking at. But the thing mm -hmm. is that they were doing those particular types of building three centuries ago by hand not by computer and so i wonder whether in fact there is a circularity in this going back to where it all started for complex forms with stone i think that we yeah i think i guess as we were saying i think we in the next semester will try and tackle more head-on the the way in which you would build with stone i guess with the precedents, the way in which we were speaking about them was almost with like architectural ideas. So we talk about mm -hmm. the architectural idea of carving or the architectural idea of stacking. Um, but what's clear within stone is that, you know, there are ways in which you make an arch that will stand up and there are other ways in which you make an arch where it will fall down. And it feels like if we had a structural engineer on board earlier, we could kind of more clearly define examples and ways of using stone, understanding them, and then hopefully try and push them a bit, perhaps with the use of technology. So that the really the way in which you're building with stone starts to talk about the, the kind of grammar or language of architecture that you're, you're using. So engaging with that more, I think, definitely is what we feel like at the beginning of next semester would be good to do. Okay, please. Audience, please participate in this debate. Otherwise, we'll move smoothly onto the grounds of uh, Professor Vinant, I would say, unless Eve wants to step in to this debate as a, as a trade union with, uh, with his own atelier. Thank you, Paolo, for this invitation introduction. Yes, it's true, as an architect and structural engineer, I'm very interested in building and construction related to architecture. And we are running a studio uh, together with Petras Vestartas and Nicola Rougo. Uh, we are interested in articulating art and technique, meaning that we believe that uh, technical skills and tools may also enrich the architectural design processes and the architectural discourse as such. What we are also trying to do with the students in architecture is to stimulate the scientific research culture, meaning that we are open them up to reading scientific articles or publications, journal publications. So in fact, we are looking for construction methods and systems, sustainable construction methods and systems embedded in an architectural synthesis of quality. We also see architecture as a performance and as a civic engagement and choice. So um, that's what we would like to try to do with the students and also to attract their consensus of what we do, which what materials we do it in relation to all those different techniques and tools we have at our disposal. So I would like now to invite uh, Petras Vestastas to introduce the studio to see how we position it last semester, and later Nicola Rogo will follow and comment some of the architectural outcomes of last semester. Petras, could you take uh, over? Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So. Atelier Wynand Autumn 2020 is called Reuse of Cultural Heritage. And 
we try to analyze uh, existing sanatorium that currently has no functional value. It's currently abandoned. And I'll introduce uh, by introducing the, the site. Uh, so the site is is in Rosaire. Uh, there is no like big cities around. Essentially, there's one big uh, uh, railroad and some like pathways to walk around uh, the mountain areas. So it's really a big uh, block of uh, heritage building that currently has no function uh, value. Essentially, it was uh, not used due to economical reasons. And we try to investigate and, and to understand the, also the client, what, what what was the changes during the years of this uh, big uh, building unit in close to Swiss Alps. Um, so this is the current situation. Uh, it has no no use right now. And, uh, and there were several functions that were working or not working before. So first it was a preventorium for tuberculosis uh, patients. Uh, then it was uh, strangely changed to the French uh, language school only for, for Swiss German women. Then uh, a language school and recreational center. But all these functions were kind of lost because now it does not meet any fire safety requirements. And this is like one point, but the second point is for sure that nobody's using this, this building uh, in the middle of kind of nowhere. The reason why this building was built in the first place is, is for sanatorium. People were coming here for fresh air, uh, essentially to, uh, to have a better health after staying here for, for, for some, some, some time. So we have amazing uh, landscape in the Swiss Alps. We even uh, brought like round wood close to all these mountains in, in our school. Um, there are some villages around it, but you have this huge standing block uh, in a big hill, um, totally contradictory for any context uh, and, and so on. That's how it looks right now. Um, it's, it's abandoned heritage building in, in several stories. Uh, it has a uh, really interesting composition itself. It, it looks like symmetrical, but it has also additional uh, elements like a chapel and different heritage values inside. So one point was, was to actually introduce the arts or art and, and technique to students to give, give a really some, some basic building units or, or techniques to work with. So first uh, we scanned uh, the building from outside and uh, Moxon's a student from previous atelier uh, did a nice job from Fox exterior part. Uh, but then we also scanned the, the interior part, which was, I think, even a, a harder job to, to really understand all the spaces that you can, cannot really comprehend from simple 2D plans or, or sections. So this was just for, for understanding the, the volumetric uh, elements. Then we tried to change or propose a different function to the building by introducing a convention center. And we had to fit it to, to existing scale because we know that there are multiple different convention centers. Like this, uh, the EPFL one is this modern, uh, huge, big one convention center, but there are also smaller ones that might uh, uh, make this building work again. Um, so the function from like typical bedrooms that was uh, used in, in, in preventorium is now changed to, to meeting rooms and hotel rooms, but the scale uh, of the function is not changing, meaning that we don't subtract or add uh, additional volumes inside the building. We also introduced uh, tools that uh, students could use. Uh, Today, it's, it's a nice day because we are publishing some tools for architects, not for only Atelier, for, not for our own research, but we can uh, have a tools that architects uh, or side research can, can use and this is open sourced uh, now and first was the question like okay we have just a simple uh, measurement tool it's it's not simple but uh, the way it collects the data it's not very like sophisticated essentially it's accurate measurements in 3d space but it can get additional uh, properties. Like you can use it for simulations, you can use for long-term long availability, meaning you can track the changes over time. You have a holistic understanding of the site and, and you look at the building in the perspectives you, you didn't think that 
that can be seen from those points of view. Have quite a quick survey. You get lots of data and you need to post-process it. Uh, you can reach unreachable areas, which was for us was also interesting to, to, to find out because we could not just find out quickly by just taking a few photos. Um, and then controlling and measurement uh, how these spaces do differ from, from actual 2D plans and sections that we actually built a little bit differently in reality. And what we usually miss is that we, we get also the color data. Uh, normally we, we perceive the drawings or, or the models as you know the 3D volume, volumes, but the mo moment you introduce the, uh, the colors, the textures, it gets additional layer of, um, of intricacy or, or in, in in the modeling process but then the question happens okay you have the survey data and what you can do and uh, we also went through research papers and what people are using it for uh, the most straightforward way you scan a building and you introduce additional building elements to kind of uh, make uh, for instance timber claddings in, in inside the building volume so so the spaces uh, looks kind of new from inside but from outside it has the same look. Then you can also mix the data for visual, visualization purposes. You, you have uh, like a CAD drawings and you have a point cloud visualization. Um, and then there's also another interesting process that you can scan models and then scale it up uh, for, for design reasons. And, and fourth, this is more a question. Um, we have additional data that is mostly noise and how you can reduce everything so that it's it's, it's the most uh, usable for you and then and how to to know which data is like good and which one is is not really needed uh as we had uh, uh Ibois, the, the timber laboratory we also introduce uh, the timber uh, tools essentially we want to make the timber joinery for architects a bit easier so the focus would be a design process but not uh, the detailed modeling process on each uh, joint. So we introducing the vocabulary in, in, in the CAD models. Uh, also, we have a different specification of uh, timber joinery, and we also can combine those timber joinery with uh, uh, robotic assembly, uh, mainly focusing on Rhino and, and Grasshopper tools. And then coming to the task, uh, we formulated several tasks that students must act on. So the first point of this building was to find the, the most valuable spaces. Um, by book, if you just take this building, you cannot change anything. And that must be clearly said, like you can paint something, you can like change details, but we wanted to have a bit different look uh, by asking what if, what if we can like remove volumes, we can change some spaces. So to get, not to get to give students a bit more freedom regarding the, the creative process. Uh, the second step, which was always uh, quite hard, but uh, it's also important that when a student is designing something, uh, a student sometimes jumping from one idea to another idea to a third idea, and sometimes he's jumping like during all the semester. So we really asked in the first weeks to, to say, what is your concept? Uh, and then stick to that concept and develop really in detail for, for, for the whole semester. So this was kind of artistic representation or asking for one artistic representation of the building. And then the task 2A was to, to mix the media between the, the 2D CAD drawings and, and, and the point cloud representation. We also had 2B task, but it, it's a practical uh, a task that I don't want to mention because it didn't uh, work during, uh, during the, the corona uh, station. Um, but then I will directly give a, a a slides to to Nicola. Uh, I don't know, Nicola. Do you want to to, to use my PowerPoint, or, or you want to share your screen to make? A you can continue. Uh, I will just comment the slide. Okay. okay. Thank you, Petras. So I will just go quickly uh, through a selection of the projects uh, that we had this year. Um, so the goal is to show you a bit how the the laser scanning techniques uh, had an impact on the on the workflow of the studio. So first we have this very noisy image as you can see. Um, and the question for the students was, what are we going to do with such data? How to, uh, to go and delve into the project uh, with, a, with a fuzzy point cloud. And so you will see, Petras, you can go to the next one, please. So one of the points was just to 
like the, the most simplest point is to rebuild the three D model. But then the next step, uh, I think. Yeah. So uh, the the scanning process has two main advantages. One is to rebuild model, and the other one is to challenge a bit the traditional way of representing a project. And so as you can see on uh, this image from uh, Carla and Alicia, two of our students, the, uh, the scanning process unveiled really the layer and the inner structure of the project. And it helped her to uh, really define what zones they, they wanted to, to keep and what zones they wanted to work on and to identify a particular area of the project uh, that were interesting for them. Can you go to the next one? Yeah. So here also in the section, you can see uh, different ways of representing the, the building using the bound cloud as a background to better understand the relation with the site, especially here with the trees and uh, more far away the mountains. Uh, combining the CAD drawing, the photo, the pictures, and also the bound cloud, we could get really a better understanding of the surroundings of the building. So here, here we can go just through a few drawings of the students. So we asked them to uh, implement a new program. And here you can see that during site visits, in their case, they identified the problematic of the light in the inner corridor. So they decided to push further uh, the, the quality of the space to, to adapt also for the new functions that we propose. And then for instance, we could not really understand the, the roof structure. That was also an interesting step that we could reconstruct the, the roof structure based on, on those measurements. And that was kind of totally hidden from, uh, from actually from the spaces that are uh, inside. So here also you can see how we can have a very different look at the circulation inside the building. So it gives really a new perspective on how to uh, how to handle the circulation and the services of the different rooms. Here, this project was really focusing on uh, developing a kind of rebound from a uh, start to, to finish in the building and to, to connect all the different spaces, which were more in a hierarchic distribution, and now they are more connected as a one single loop. This is the same project, just uh, a few pictures of execution of. of of the 3D models and materials. Here also a more radical project. Uh, they called it the cut, brave name. So they decided to do a very strong gesture. Uh, and here it was uh, a bit challenging because of course the scanning process unveils the surfaces, but not the inside of the building. So here they decided to take it a bit more literally and to try to do a kind of X-ray of the, the structure. And so it was a very challenging uh, project for them. Uh, but uh, at, at the end, it was interesting to see uh, what was really the, the structure behind uh, this envelope. It's the same cut from different view. You can find all those projects on the, the Miro board too. So I'm not going to spend too much time inside each of them. You can see the programmatic distribution too. So for each project, we ask them in the second phase to push the project until the details. Uh, and so we spend half of the semester working on the concept and half of the semester working on the details. Usually we go to the mock-up stage and we try to use uh, the CNC and uh, we have also a robot now that we can use to produce models. Uh, the only thing is that with COVID, it was a bit difficult to go into uh, physical uh, works. So we, we remain in the virtual uh, world but using the, the laser scanning techniques and the, the digital twin of the, the building, it was interesting to see that uh, we were closer to reality than if we had been working just on the, the beam model or, or such thing. Here another project where they also kind of dig a hole inside the full building. So the proposal was to build an atrium to also bring light in the building. It was one of the main challenges since you can see the, the building is quite thick. So uh, in order to have uh, proper spaces for meeting and conventions, you, you need to, uh, to bring more light into the building. This is kind of the same gesture, but going to the reference, going to the historical references. And I think one of the interesting points was that 
uh, working with this heritage, you have to tune uh, like the spaces that they have like a proper scale. And like those historical references have really proper scaling while the students like really struggle to, 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 to find like a new inscription in existing fabric. And like really we worked a lot of the proportions of, of kind of new intervention as well. Um, and then how, how the materiality of those kind of volumes can be introduced as a details. So you can see that some students, they use the point cloud as a background, some others, they use it for the model. Uh, some others use it more as a reference to build an accurate 3D model of the building. So we were not too dogmatic there. They, they have the choice of how they wanted to use the tool. We were just introducing the, the tools to the students so they, they could have the, the knowledge on how to use them. They also had to go through the programmatic functions as well. Uh, like the function was important because the the, the circulation and, and, uh, and new functions that we proposed didn't completely matched which with what was uh, existing. Um, so here you can see another project where they decided to move the facade. There were a lot of uh, discussion and exchanges with our engineer also at was on how to uh, to build a cantilever, how to build a facade that would support the, the, the other floors of the building. So we are trying really to, to make a link between design and construction and to involve a bit more the engineers into the process also to have a real discussion and not just uh, be imposed a solution at the end of the project. So you can continue with us. Yeah. It's funny because Nicholas, it's a phone for you. <laughs> and um, yeah, and here are the, the final pictures of the studio. So we had also two guests. Perhaps you can just mention uh, Nils Larsen and also Professor Franz Graf, who joined for Final Critic. It was interesting discussion that that they brought uh, because uh, like most of the time we are spending uh, time with the students and discussing the projects, but we also like as people with the limited experience don't really see uh, what did we miss, and and they brought really interesting discourse that we kind of can reflect in the future once we can once we are working with the similar problems. So I think it was was a nice critique to, to get also international guests as well. Mm -hmm. so, to show. Okay. so thank you for your attention. I'll stop sharing my screen. If you have any questions, ask. Paolo, you're on mute. You're on mute, Paolo. I'm mute. No, no, I was just prodding the participants to the orientation to actually take part in this debate uh, and ask as many questions as possible, given the, given the opportunity before us. So um, any of those uh, black slate um, screens would like to... Okay, well then I, I would like to ask a question myself if no one does. Uh, Shall I? Of course. And so um, given that you've actually acquired this great capacity to record the, 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 building, the building in existing and its actual geometry, to what extent did that type of knowledge um, condition or inform the choices when it came to the, the, the technology in use? Because most of the building was done in timber, right? And so was there an attempt to, to adapt or adopt, in a sense, the, 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 the building fabric choices that already been there? Or would one uh, sort of approach that as an existing, as an existing 
an existing landscape to colonize, to colonize in different ways? Well, I think the, the bound cloud doesn't give any, you know, all information about the way the existing building has been built. I mean, there were concrete parts in it and also brick parts in it. And as it shows, the roof is a wooden structure. So the point cloud gives, I think, a very good reference to uh, the students. And as they said, they can choose the way they use actually that tool in order to introduce it. But still, we had to look at, let's say, classical drawings also to see the exact positions of concrete. And at some points, we didn't have the information of the existing in detail. So we had to do some interpretation in addition. So the, 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 to answer your question, I don't believe that uh, the point plot would lead to direct choices of, let's say, materials or something like that, if I understood you well. Uh, right. There was still an interpretation. And also, let's say, you would, for example, this project we showed where they had to carry up the whole facade because she was digging into the building. This is more like a technical structural engineering discussion which we had on the site than something which was directly informed by the point cloud. Uh, so still, uh, you, these discussions are open. No, no, right. The reason I was I was saying that is because I remember the discussion that we had about this with the point cloud last semester when you actually intervene on that timber building. It was a timber structure, and you know, emphasis was actually placed on your ability to actually determine the perfect sizing of all the members of the carpentry there in order to in a sense, establish a conversation with the past. And that's why, hence my question, you know, it was just that. Uh, yeah, that, that was more the case last semester, as you had just pointed out. This time we didn't have, you know, just like very precise infields or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was also programmatically a much more complex uh, building to handle. Still a little bit heterogeneous in general. So as you saw, opened up to very different kinds of intervention yeah. of the students. I really like the fact that they were not copying too much and we had very different solutions, let's say, proposed yeah. by the students. Very nice. Yeah, like one of the key things that surprised us that uh, the approaches to the same project were completely dif different from group to group. And while well, the last semester it was re really, really similar. And, and for me, the tools didn't give this ability, the actual, the, the approach of the students and, and the chosen building proposed it. So tools remain tools, creative processes is probably more important always. That's... Okay. Well, thank you very much. So are there any, any other sort of pressing questions about uh, this atelier or the future or the next semester? You want to say anything about what will happen next semester? <laughs> No, it's a secret. We'll keep it wrap. <laughs> we uh, just released the, the presentation uh, on the on the PFL site, so you can already check that okay. we, uh, we are going to work on the ski station. So. Okay, that's a very efficient way of doing that. <laughs> okay, well, I guess if there are no other questions, that we should move from an almost. Oh yes, Maxence. Yes, perhaps I can extend also relating to the previous pr um, presentation we had about stone is. Uh, I would like to ask to um, Maria and uh, Joe and. Uh, how would you perceive this uh, kind of new tools for architects in terms of uh, analyzing existing contexts such as quarries and, and such a material that might not be uh, perfect from the, from the start? And do you see any, any, any value to uh, architectural tectonics uh, to be implemented? So uh, did you mean in relation to the, the kind of technologies that were presented just before, just now? Yeah, we were actually just um, discussing it privately, how it'd be really cool to collaborate and to scan, you know, next time we go to the quarry to scan it and to um, introduce that element to our work because we have been quite um, analog in a lot of ways apart from the drone. Um, but yeah, I think it would be really cool. And also maybe to analyze um, the mineral qualities or mm. other things which um, seem very distant to us as designers, but could be really interesting mm. for sure. Yep, I, I share this opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I guess in the interest of time, then we should continue in order to be able to finish um, on time. Uh, so I guess we go from a, a derelict, almost derelict building 
to a series of destroyed ones in the in the in the in the context of the third atelier, which was led by Andrea Ulla, Ivan Warrenbon, and Riccardo Vannucci, and had to do with humanitarian um, construction architectural program. So, um, um, am I? Am I, I? I can't see you guys. So, um, are you ready, Andrea? Yeah. Are you ready? Uh, yeah. How are we for time? Are we supposed to finish at four o'clock? Uh, we have twenty. No, uh, four thirty. Okay. No worries. Um, I do not have a presentation per se, or at least a PowerPoint. What I'm going to do is uh, show the mirror board that we've laid out and perhaps it'll serve as a bit of an introduction for people who are interested to explore those students work later. Uh, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Hello. Okay, Max. Thanks, Max. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the uh, the effects on bandwidth that the mirror board together with the video we're going to have. Well, let's see how we go. And perhaps if people can raise their hands for me if it's really unclear, uh, if you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Um, so the studio was called Far From Home. Uh, we were investigating how architecture can contribute to the provision of humanitarian assistance. Uh, and in particular, in this case, humanitarian assistance for people displaced by conflict. Um, we were 28 students, uh, three teachers, as Paolo mentioned, Ivan, Warren Ricardo Venucci, and myself. And the studio also included a series of seminars from different humanitarian organizations that talked about, uh, I guess, their specific expertise or their specific fields of action and how that might relate to architecture. So we had Medair talking about health, save the children, talking about education, Evag uh, talking about uh, wash, water supply, uh, health and sanitation, uh, sanitation and health, uh, UNHCR protection, UNHCR about, uh, ICRC about conflict settings. So <laughs> I guess the, the objectives of the studio, as I said, to explore uh, humanitarian assistance and how architecture, architecture can contribute in two ways, I guess. The first was the function of buildings. Um, so how can buildings uh, combine, integrate the different fields of humanitarian assistance, which are normally considered separately, so shelter, health, education. Uh, are there ways that uh, a new look at architecture could start to bring some of these functions together and thereby um, benefit in terms of the assistance they provide. Uh, the other part of that function of buildings that we looked at was looking at buildings as uh, configurations of resources. How can the resources used in buildings and the ways in which they are strategically brought together, how can they respond to the, the political, the economic, the, the social conditions that characterize uh, humanitarian settings and conflict and post-conflict settings in this situation? Uh, the other aspect of it was the function of architects. Uh, how do architects work in the, the, the professional landscape, the disciplinary milieu that characterizes uh, humanitarian programs, which is very different from you know, the groupings of uh, planners, engineers, uh, other building professionals that architects might uh, be accustomed to working with, and it involves instead specialists in, as I mentioned before, the fields like health, education, protection. Uh, how might the, the coordinating, the integrating role of architects and architecture uh, work within that context? And would that prioritize certain aspects of architectural work? Uh, the studio was organized in, well, actually I should step back first. So we took as the main subject of the studio, the conflict in Syria. And there were two main reasons for this. First of all, uh, the situation in Syria is at the forefront of this, of a, a general trend in humanitarian assistance away from the provision of assistance in camps and starting to look at uh, the provision of assistance in urban settings. So the diffusion of refugees or displaced people throughout existing towns and cities and rather than concentration in settlements and how might we provide assistance within that context. Uh, and the second one was the, the regional scope of the conflict in Syria. 
you have uh, urban settings in not just within Syria, but also in, in Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, affected by the displacement of millions of Syrians. So it gave us, looking at Syria gave us an opportunity to look at very different uh, urban settings characterized by very different economic, social, political conditions. Now, the studio was organized around three separate exercises. Uh, the first exercise was, I guess, a bit of an introduction and a crash course for students in uh, to introduce them to, I guess, the, the parameters of humanitarian assistance, the jargon that characterizes humanitarian assistance, the different objectives, um, the different forms. So the, what we did is present the students with a fictional humanitarian scenario. And it was linked with the, the fire at the camp at uh, Moria and Lesbos. And we presented them with a situation in which if the Swiss government accepted, I think it was 40 families plus 40 individuals and asked the canton of Fribourg to then provide emergency assistance for those people. Uh, Hopefully you can see here, uh, we asked students to plan a, a humanitarian response to meet the emergency needs of these, uh, these 40 families plus 40 individuals, I think it was. Yes, 30 families and 40 individuals. And we chose a site at FFL Freewell, or the site of FFL Freewell. Uh, it's the old Cardinal Brewery, uh, a site like many others around Switzerland, else, elsewhere in the world. It's, it's a, near the centre of town, an old industrial site disused, which FFL is now occupying with a couple of other universities. A uh, series of uh, derelict plus uh, renovated buildings, new buildings, open spaces and adjacent train run. Uh, now we ask students to think about how might the various needs of these uh, refugee families be accommodated both in the immediate, so the very short term, and then the medium term, and then what might be the prospects or the strategies for integration in the longer term. Uh, if I can show you some of the work. So it was interesting to see the students take very different responses, uh, very different approaches to the problem. Um, okay, so some of the students, or most of them, this group did quite well in looking at the different needs that this particular group of people would have and how those needs might be met by different architectural typologies. Um, but I guess the main thing here is to think about the needs and how all of the groups address them in very different ways. Uh, this group in particular ended up selecting not the site that we proposed, but a nearby military barracks as a more suitable site. Um, other groups used emphasized very much the emergency aspect of it. Uh, this group here, you can see they, they took an existing building on the site. Uh, it's an old, the old bottling factory and looked at how those facilities might be used for emergency accommodation and, and how people might be organized, how services might be organized within that space, the large warehouse space. Um, some groups had very well, it's very, that's a very temporary solution. And in contrast, uh, other groups looked at more longer term solutions uh, that could evolve and adapt and then uh, form, I guess, centers of other communal functions in the long term. So this group looked at using uh, this influx of refugees as the starting point, the instigation of uh, a longer term cultural facility. So you can see here using shipping containers, which uh, we tried to discourage, but nevertheless. Uh, another interesting project took a very creative look at it and really delved into this idea of what is the role of architects uh, in, uh, in a humanitarian setting or in meeting humanitarian needs. So this group actually stepped away from the provision of a, a design product and looked more at the process. So how might architects facilitate, facilitate a process or design a process in which the beneficiaries themselves actually define their needs and the ways of meeting them. Uh, so that was the first introductory exercise, as I said, using a, a familiar territory to give the students an introduction to humanitarian aid. Uh, the second exercise then looked to apply that new knowledge to unfamiliar ground. Uh, 
So essentially to start to apply this understanding of the different forms of humanitarian assistance, what are some of the constraints and challenges, technical requirements, institutional structures, and to start to apply those to three sites associated with the Syrian conflict. So three sites linked, well, I guess, in some ways with the work of some of our different partners, friends, collaborators in the studio. So Hamidia is a neighbourhood in Homs. Uh, uh, some of you might remember from 2012, the siege of Homs. Uh, Hamidia was part of that. It's just to the north of the old city of Homs in the centre. You can see the old tell here uh, and with the city, with Hamidia, the area here. Uh, traditionally a Christian enclave, with, uh, I guess in more contemporary times, more diverse population. Uh, largely deserted until you know, around a year or two ago, people have started coming back. There aren't many international organisations engaged in Syria, but in particular ICRC are, given their neutral mandate, they're working on a hospital nearby in the area down here. Uh, the second site was in Beirut, uh, Carantina, uh, the name of the neighbourhood here, right near the port of Beirut. So it's traditionally a migrant centre, so it's right next to an industrial zone, uh, not particularly prestigious accommodation. So it is this, uh, a site where a lot of migrants uh, initially enter Beirut at. Uh, beyond uh, the impact of the conflict in Syria on Carantina, you also, or we also had the impact of the explosion, if people can remember last August. There was the explosion in Beirut, and you can see here that was actually the site of that explosion. Uh, so many, if not all, of the buildings in Carantina were heavily damaged by that explosion. Uh, the third site is at Zatri, Jordan, which I guess stretched the, the, the focus of the studio on urban settings. Zatri is a refugee camp. Uh, established around 2011. Uh, it peaked at a population of around 200,000 in 2000, around 2012 13. It's back down nowadays to around 80,000 uh, Syrians living there. But what we were proposing to the students is to uh, think about the transition of Zatri from a, a temporary refugee camp to a permanent settlement, which we can be fairly confident that's what it's going to become like many of these uh, refugee camps. Uh, it's not easy for people to return home and often you have generations that will reside and so in turn they become permanent settlements. But then what does that imply for a camp of Zatri in relation to the Zatari in relation to the village, the uh, established village of Zatri? Uh, so in exercise two, we ask the students to essentially to undertake an urban analysis to try and understand uh, what are these sites, what are the, well, what are the different uh, characteristics of these places, the, the existing urban form, infrastructure networks, uh, social organisation or you know, communities in living there, um, the economic situation political governor or governance situation in each place. And then as a second part to look at uh, what are the particular humanitarian needs that the populations have? Is it shelter? Is it health? Uh, is it education? Uh, and then finally to devise uh, an urban humanitarian response that will address these needs. Now, beyond the, I guess, a, a standard site analysis, one of the things that this involved was the students to really develop strategies of um, extrapolation. For most of these, well, for all three sites, perhaps Zatri the least, there is a real restriction on the available information. How do students actually gather information on the site, uh, on the particular sites, and then how can they extrapolate that to a broader understanding about the requirements there? So the students worked in groups uh, groups of three to four. And so just to kind of orient you around the board before I go any further. So we have here on the left, uh, the assignments, uh, the work from exercise two, and then on the right here, 
which I'll go into after uh, the work from exercise three. So working in groups, as I mentioned, the students work on strategies um, to take a look. So looking at HOMS, for example, this group came up with uh, a response strategy that involved three separate hubs. I, I should step back also. The idea was at the end of this that the students would come up with sites and programs for architectural proposals that they would develop in the next exercise. So we can see this group um, came up with three separate hubs, a rebuilding hub, which would focus on uh, in the very short term, providing the skills and the materials that people need to rebuild their homes in homes in Hamidia. Uh, a second, an artisanal hub uh, associated with the old souk of homes. So looking at uh, how can the traditional crafts be preserved and in doing so, how can uh, vocational or how can livelihoods be restored for some of the people living in Hamidia. And then finally, a cultural hub, which isn't coming up clearly on my screen, but so this, was, this was interesting in that it framed um, culture and art as a part of an overlooked part of reconstruction. And what should be, uh, what this group thought was should be an integral part of uh, reconstruction in Syria, both reinforcing uh, specific ethnic identities or cultural identities, but also reinforcing uh, cultural similarities, I guess, uh, communal cohesion. Uh, other groups, uh, what do I look at one in? So this is similar. So this is looking at Hamidia in Beirut. Sorry, step back. Uh, Carantina in Beirut. Again, three separate hubs, uh, looking at how existing buildings uh, within the neighborhood might be reused for different functions. And this, like many of the other schemes, uh, the students, one interesting thing here was the students went beyond the normal boundaries, uh, the silos perhaps of humanitarian assistance. You know, it's normal that, you know, particular organizations focus on WASH, they do WASH programs without looking too much at education, for example. Whereas the students were able to cross these boundaries and think a bit more broadly about how we might bring them together in different ways. Uh, and then explore that architecturally. So there's a group uh, with the three poles, the, the protection pole, the listing pole, and the equipment pole for reconstruction. Um, this group, again, looking at Carantina, came up with proposals, something a bit more ephemeral, I guess. Uh, two aspects to this. One was how uh, a radio station might uh, contribute or might assist the population at Carantina. Uh, so the Syrian refugees in Lebanon largely being denied the legal status of refugees, um, provides them or excludes them from access to many services and obviously has an impact on identity there. So one of the schemes here looked at how a radio station might uh, might enable both the distribution of information, but also communal cohesion uh, within the area of Carantina. And then looking at drama, theatre again and art and how that might build identity um, and build community within Carantina for the Syrian refugees, for the, Syri the displaced Syrians there. Um, looking at Zatri, there was an, this project I found quite interesting in that I mean, this was very ambitious. So these students looked at how the camp at Zatri, not just about how it might be integrated with the village of Zatri nearby, but how it might be, uh, I guess, connected to the city of Mafrak nearby. And this was largely to do with livelihoods. If you're going to have a sustainable settlement or a refugee camp turned into a sustainable settlement, people need to earn a living uh, without a lot of commercial activity or industrial activity going on in the settlement. How might people access jobs in the town and how might we use uh, this camp to stimulate broader economic development in the region? Uh, very ambitious, perhaps, perhaps overly ambitious for the scope of our studio, but from that ambitious program, the students were able to extract quite an interesting strategy of looking at just a bus line. 
and something that I thought was both very simple, very feasible, but potentially very efficient and effective as a way of uh, integrating the camp and creating a sustainable settlement. Um, so that's exercise two. So from, from that, we then asked the students to select particular sites and particular programs and develop those as architectural proposals. Um, I don't know, is that clear to people or are you getting that quite blurred? Yeah, it's quite blurred for us also. It's quite blurred, so I need to slow down with how I'm moving. Um, I think is that we're getting seasick <laughs> almost okay. with all this movement. <laughs> right. uh, I'll stop zooming out and maybe I'll pan around. Okay, here's an interesting uh, scheme from that arose from the scheme I mentioned before about the three hubs, the reconstruction hub, the artisanal hub, and the cultural or artistic hub. And then looking in particular at the reconstruction hub. So Benjamin's scheme was interesting in the way that it used a very simple architectural response to develop quite interesting spaces, complex spaces. Uh, Max, is that, or Paolo, is that very, that's not clear, I assume? It's still pretty blurry, yeah. But we see the general typology, let's say. Yeah, okay, so let me just, there we go. That will do. So it's a standard section, uh, again, responding very much to the, I guess, resource constraints and the need for speed. Uh, if this building is going to support reconstruction, it has to be up and running before people are starting to rebuild their own homes. Um, so taking that into account, Benjamin proposed a very simple architectural section, a uh, cross section of a building, but then essentially extruded that section to create a couple of separate, both interior spaces for material storage, uh, production of building components, uh, some training spaces, some other associated spaces, uh, a large courtyard for delivery and distribution of materials, but then also a small courtyard uh, just to provide a more secluded space for the training and other functions. So as I said, I thought this was interesting as both a response to the very specific humanitarian requirements, uh, the broader resource constraints, uh, in a way that created quite an interesting architectural response. Um, apologies, I'll zoom out slowly. Uh, so that's Hamidia. Um, and then look at something, there was something from Cantina. Uh, uh, the group that proposed the, okay, why don't we come here? So, the group that proposed the playhouse uh, for uh, Carantina then uh, came up with an architectural proposal that has extended that idea of the playhouse, but also integrated it with a, a more prosaic, more pragmatic function, uh, an administrative office or uh, administrative functions for the, the organisations, the NGOs, the UN agencies that would be involved in the reconstruction. Um, now, I'm a little worried that this is not going to become clear, but it was uh, an interesting response that looked at both the, the speed of construction, uh, but also engaged with the time of deconstruction. So uh, the, taking into account the limited uh, scope of humanitarian action. So part of the building being uh, demountable, the other part being uh, permanent. Um, I think that is not going to become clearer. Um, Andre, zoom in first and then out. Yeah, I think the way in and then out. Yeah, I think this is a very high resolution. Uh, oh, it's it take a while. So why don't I move on? Zoom out. Here? Zoom out. No, no, never mind. No, it's not going to work. Okay. Uh, Okay, Vivian from the same group came up, took it in a very different direction. Uh, so she looked at how small scale interventions might have broader uh, communal impacts. So she looked at how some small urban intervention, uh, strategically placed urban interventions might 
provide broader services and access to broader services. So, and these, there were some interesting images here that she had. So she was really looking here at uh, just how to do some, create some shaded communal spaces so you, using very uh, small scale architectural interventions and temporary arch architectural interventions to really try and uh, shift this, uh, I guess, view of Carantina as a site of poverty, as a, a neglected part of the city and really start to install some sort of uh, pride in the, in the area. Uh, so you can see here some of the responses, a lot of it, is, it's painting, it's, uh, but then it's looking at providing some urban shelter, some shelter for people to congregate, given the small scale and uh, the lack of spaces within homes. And she also looked at seat, different seating designs, how yeah, that might work. Um, so looking at a very different scale to some of the other proposals. Um, I'm conscious that I want to make you all more seasick, but why don't I finish off with this scheme? So going back to Clara, Laura and Sarah and how they, this bus line, a, a bus, a series of bus stations wouldn't normally be considered uh, part of humanitarian response, but I think that was uh, one of the interesting things about the studio, that students could take a broader view and look beyond the silos. So, uh, Clara, Laura and Sara each chose a different site, one within uh, the settlement, uh, the camp at Zatri, one adjacent to the village of Zatri and one within Mafrak, the nearby city, and designed bus stations to accommodate these informal small scale buses. I'm not sure what, how many of you might envisage it, but it might be like a, a Toyota Hiace van that would normally seat eight people, you can probably jam 15 people in it uh, in some place in the Middle East. Uh, there will be individual owners running backwards and forwards. The van, once the van's full, they drive off. Um, so how might this informal bus line be supported by three bus stations? So the, the three projects used, I guess, started with uh, similar architectural strategies, but then had came up with different material programmatic spatial responses that looked at their particular sites. So this is Clara's uh, and um, this isn't going to come up as well, but really this is in Zatri and it's really extending this architectural language of the container, the, ri the rigid uh, temporary structure that in which most of the people at Zatri, Zatri camp live and looking at how those materials, uh, those construction techniques might be uh, reconfigured for a bus station, which, which went beyond the normal functions of a bus station and started to look at how, uh, started to look at how uh, it might create public spaces for other functions. I mean, when I, it's difficult for you to see here in the scheme, but when I looked at it, I could see old men sitting around playing cards in this bus station, rather than people just looking uh, waiting for a bus. Uh, the scheme also, like all three of the schemes, looked in a very interesting way at how movement, uh, how people might move through the space versus how the buses might. Uh, I'm not going to do justice here to the three schemes. Here we go. Here's another one from Laura. This was at Zatri town uh, on the outskirts of the village. Um, again, look, using a similar uh, palette of materials, but in very different ways, creating very different spaces. Um, a lot of it is lightweight, rapidly built, uh, and I guess responding to the limited means, the limited resources that we might expect for something like this, but then creating quite, quite interesting architectural proposal that also created a, a real signpost along the freeway uh, for both the camp and the village. And, gave facilities that weren't just for use by the refugees, but also by people in the broader area to, again, to facilitate this broader integration. Um, and then finally, we had Sardis, which hopefully, no. Similar language, but looking at uh, in the city of Mafrak, uh, starting to look at concerns less with uh, a broader program and more with the permanence of the materials used. 
so that's what I wanted. I would invite everyone to look in more detail with greater bandwidth, I think, than I have here at the students' work. Uh, I think we're all really pleased with it. I think we asked a lot of the students, we provided a very loose framework for them to work in uh, and to, I guess, to gradually accustom themselves to a very different scope of work than they would have been used to a very different objectives and they would have been used to in other studios but some great outcomes in the end and I think they all did really well um, please take a look at the mirror board when you have time thank you very much Andre um so um as um Andre's narration raised any any compelling questions curiosities and um I don't know comments on it anyone would like to to become part of this conversation. I think I've made everyone seasick. Probably not. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly me. But... <laughs> Anyone? Oh, yes, Maria, please. I uh, just, uh, thanks so much. Um, yeah, very ambitious studio. I wondered, uh, what were you, what was your thinking behind choosing the locations? Why did you look at more than one, for example? Yeah. <laughs> the main reason for looking at more than one, I think underpinning it was this idea of stability, uh, the different levels of political stability in, in each situation. And then there were also obviously social and economic differences, but uh, we were interested to see how uh, the, the, the difference in the durability or the permanence of the architectural proposals that might come of it, given the different political circumstances. And it was quite different in the end to what I was expecting. I thought that given the heightened political instability in Syria that students would be proposing uh, more temporary solutions, architectural proposals there, compared to uh, then uh, Lebanon, where although uh, where the, the refugees then, well, they're not afforded their legal status of refugees, so their status there is much more unstable but still it might have, might encourage uh, architectural proposals that are slightly more durable. And then to the other extreme, to uh, Jordan, where given the welcoming nature of the government there uh, for Syrian refugees, that it might lead to more durable, permanent architectural responses. So that was largely behind the three sides, but you're right, it was very ambitious. Uh, and in hindsight, perhaps overly ambitious, um, but still that, by choosing three very different sites, it led to, to proposals or architectural solutions, ideas that were very different in their own ways. Anyone else? Um, Ivan, would you like to make a comment, given your participation in the studio? Oh, well, I think for me as a, as a humanitarian practitioner, uh, it was a, a very interesting uh, process to try to bring, uh, you know, as we discussed initially, it's, it was not about teaching, but more about training, it was to see whether I, I work with SDC and uh, as a humanitarian architect, and the question is always that comes back again and again, is that can we train young architects to become humanitarian practitioners? Um, and it, it was a highly interesting uh, uh, journey for me to do this, because uh, uh, it, the, the, the students showed a, 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 an incredible level of maturity and, and uh, capacity to uh, grasp uh, such a complex uh, uh, environment. Um, and just to come back to Maria's question, you know, and, and I thought the fact to expose them to many different uh, contexts and, uh, and problems, because they, they, they had to, to, to build the brief themselves after the analysis, we, we were not we were not teaching, we were only guiding them through the process. Uh, it was really them, because this is what humanitarian architecture is about, is we, can, we need to learn every day, because each context is different. Uh, and we must do a lot with uh, nothing, you know, with uh, some zinc sheets and, and a few timber posts. And, and I was impressed how the students could really engage and, and propose uh, very, very valid and realistic uh, uh, interventions. Um, and, uh, and, and they have a lot uh, inside, you know, that they have a lot of knowledge. And, and it's, it was uh, highly interesting for us to see how we can, um, you know, make it blossom or, or appear. Thank you. 
it was a fantastic experience for me. Well, given the thing, thank you very much, Ivan. So given the time, would that be a good positive note to end with or to end on? And then uh, asking her, you want to come back in second semester and spend a great end of the year, given the circumstances? Or are there any other, any other commentaries that people would like to make? Well, I would personally want to thank you, Paolo, for inviting me to, to this uh, FAR. It, it was uh, fantastic, as I just said, and I really thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. And we thank you all for, <laughs> for having taken part in it. Well, if, uh, if there are no other questions or, or you know, signs of enthusiasm, we can actually call the, call the end and then wish you all a um, Merry Christmas, very happy end of the year, and um, you know, wish to welcome you all back here in presence more than in line, possibly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Without any further ado, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.